You are listening to the Station 71 podcast with your hosts, Mario, Beth, and Brian. So, this week we're going to do probably a less serious topic, talk about some things that Disney has done that have been not so favorable, some things that maybe are unpopular opinions for us, and we'll we'll see how much we disagree on those. Um, but first up, as always, let's start with the news. So the big thing that we uh, had this week was that as Toy Story Land is approaching, we're getting more details about height requirements, park hours, and the fast passes are now open. Um, did you guys get a chance to look at any of this stuff? Yes, I did. Um, getting excited about Toy Story Land for sure, and now with all this stuff starting to to come kind of creeping out, it's uh, it's just adding to that. Yeah, it's really exciting that we're getting these details now. I mean, obviously we're so close; the fast passes are opening up, so I, I can imagine that they're going to go pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we talked about last week about the uh tier system changing right so that's not anything new but we also got the height requirements and stuff like that so it's it's all good planning details for anybody that's getting ready for a trip that's going to be close to toy story land so good stuff um operating hours for hollywood studios are going to stay um kind of similar to what they were um opening day june 30th it's currently at 8 a.m to 11 p.m and moving to 10 30 closing time um throughout july and august but that's you know just what they're reporting now um extra magic hours are offered for anyone staying on property and they are going to include all the toy story land attractions so that's a good um little tidbit there for anybody that's staying on property probably a good way to get all that that touring in if you're going to be doing like a, an extra magic hour stay mm-hmm uh okay anything else you guys want to talk about with that i know we've kind of beat the toy story land thing to death now but (laughs) i'm still patiently waiting for any announcement on the pass holder preview if it's coming oh my god i was just about to say that (laughs) i'm just like google searching every day i check my email every day to make sure like multiple times and then i have to start going and looking at articles to make sure i didn't accidentally miss it or my email wasn't on the list or something see that's the interesting thing is i never got an email for pandora i just yeah i just saw the thread on the walt disney world subreddit Mm. and someone had posted the link so i clicked it and luckily got previews but i never got an email so that's why i've been not relying on my email for it i know a lot of pass holders that didn't actually get the email um one of my friends had actually recently moved down there and i had saw the post on the subreddit and i was like huh i wonder if they've seen this so i shot them the link and everything and they didn't get an email they didn't hear anything about it but somehow they managed to get into it so i don't know if they're like really emailing it and pushing it hard for pass holder previews and stuff like that or if it's like a select few but definitely googling it and looking online is probably your best option right now Mm -hmm. i'm just wondering what's like who gets the priority is it based on how long you've been a pass holder or what or distance from them maybe yeah (laughs) i don't know so after that we had some updates for the Skyliner in both uh, Hollywood Studios and Epcot. We got some photos released of the towers going up, and I want to say that it's not as hidden as I'd like it to be. See, I kind of had the opposite opinion. I I don't know how I feel about this still, but I think it's, it's... less hidden than i want it to be but it's more hidden than i thought it would be i guess which i kind of appreciate i feel like it's not it doesn't look like it's going to be quite as intrusive as i had originally imagined it so tiebreaker brian what do you think about these (laughs) (laughs) i I, i'm not a fan of them just from these first couple of pictures that i've seen of them i do 
I think they kind of stick out, um, which was a worry. I think we all talked about having from the announcement of these. But I don't know. I mean, just the towers, in my opinion, right now don't look good. I don't know if they'll do anything to kind of spruce those up. The station um, little concept arts look pretty good. I don't mind those, but I'm, I'm really hoping the towers get kind of something put on them. Yeah, even if it was just some kind of like they planted a couple trees around it or something, mm -hmm. like, come on. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like very yeah. low effort put in so far. So after that, we've got all new Play Disney Parks app launching this summer at Walt Disney World and Disneyland. Uh, this was your article, Brian, so I'll pass this off to you because I kind of quickly glanced over this. Yeah, so there's not much word out now on what exactly this is going to be, but there is a new app that's coming to Android and iOS that is going to be somewhat interactive and allow you to do different things around the, uh, the park. According to this article, it is going to have activities that will interact with your surrounding environment. So... I'm kind of thinking this is going to be somewhat of a play off of uh, Sorcerer's of the Magic Kingdom. You know, I think they're kind of taking hints from Pokemon Go's success and trying to implement something like that in there. Um, but I'm kind of curious to see how this goes. You know, I'm definitely the kind of person that doesn't like to see people walking around Disney with their their noses in their phone the entire time because I feel like you miss a lot of the theming in the park. <laughs> Um, but mm -hmm. I can also see this done correctly that might bring out maybe some of the lesser noticed uh, theming details around the park with the app's interactivity, you know. So it's kind of up in the air to see how Disney does this before I make a decision on whether or not I like it. Yeah, I'm really interested to see what exactly comes from this. I mean, it's definitely interesting. I kind of agree with Brian in the whole, like, I don't want to see people shove their noses in their phones and all, but, you know, Pokemon Go had such a big success, and you saw it all over, even in the Disney parks. Like, Disney can't not respond to something like that that's going on. Yeah. So, do we want to dive into the topic? Let's do it. Okay, so this week... We're going to start talking about some stuff that Disney's done that hasn't been so favorable. Um, we've talked about some things on here before, but I think this week we're going to really sit down and discuss some things and maybe why they weren't as successful as Disney would have liked them to be. So first up on our list is the the pink birthday cake castle um, that Disney did for which anniversary was that again? 25th i think sounds about right maybe um but for you know let's let's lump this into one big thing and just say decorating the castle in general because we can definitely lump in the stitches great escape one in there as well um but for those of you that don't know disney has done a couple things with their castle with cinderella's castle where one they transformed it into a giant birthday cake and two, they covered it in toilet paper and graffiti for the opening of Stitch's Great Escape. Um, now, with a lot of these, we are also probably going to have opinions that maybe they weren't such a bad thing that Disney has done. Uh, and, like, for example, I don't really think that the whole Stitch's Great Escape thing was awful, especially because it was only, like, for a very short period of time. Um, so that they're kind of going to all tie into each other. But what do you guys think about the, the castle decorations? Personally, I think both of these examples were terrible. <laughs> I, I'm i not going to ever say that the castle shouldn't be touched. Because, you know, there's certain things. Like, I definitely like them putting lights on it at Christmas. And I think... I think there's certain things that you could do to it, you know, that... that wouldn't receive a lot of backlash but i don't think it's a good idea to use it as like a promotional thing for a new character or something like they did with stitch and just personally the just the design of the birthday cake castle i thought was 
just really bad. Yeah, I think that's where I'm kind of at with it. Like, I'm not opposed to them doing things like that, as long as it's not for a very long period of time. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, it it is Disney's image, you know? I mean, like, this is the the you know probably most notable feature at the disney parks is the castle so i don't think it's the thing that you should be kind of experimenting around with with these design ideas exactly i i think that if it's sparingly i don't have a huge problem with it like I understand why people would hate it because if they're trying to get their like once in a lifetime picture in front of the castle, then that's going to kind of suck. But at the same time, I think it's kind of cool that they do like interesting things from time to time, especially the ones that like, like the Stitch's Great Escape one that was like only there for like that day or like a couple days right yeah and that's where i i kind of stand with it too is like if you're gonna do something like that where it's like a fun one-off thing that's cool and uh, i mean at this point in the game it would probably generate a lot of social media hype and i think that that's something that disney would really want but the the whole stitches great escape thing was not well received at all so i know that that's such a polarizing thing (laughs) for the disney community Mm -hmm. see i didn't hate it like I thought it was kind of cool, but I think the problem that most people have is when the change is not quote unquote classy looking, like Brian was saying, he has no problem with the Christmas lights. A lot of people liked, uh, whatever that celebration was where they had all the gold picture, like the gold picture frame of Cinderella, I think. And they added like gold accents to the turrets and stuff. I think a lot of people liked that because it didn't take away a whole lot it just kind of added some extra flair yeah so i get it but at the same time i like when disney tries new things yeah i agree and that's i think that anytime that you change such an iconic um thing in the parks it's there's going to be met with a lot of backlash like could you imagine if they seriously changed like completely overhauled the haunted mansion or pirates of the caribbean like that would be a massive outlash so anytime that like something isn't quote unquote the way it should be i think that we're gonna see a lot of like angry disney (laughs) i think the best example of that like to tie it to a ride is when um the tiki room was under new management like you can't take something classic that big of an icon at disney and and try to update it with new characters i think and you know that's on a much smaller scale than messing with the castle too and that received almost you know unanimously bad opinions yeah definitely see i i guess maybe i should wait until we get to our unpopular opinions (laughs) but since it's on topic I never actually experienced under new management, but I watched a video of it and I didn't think it was terrible. Like I don't, I definitely didn't prefer it to the actual just Tiki room, but I didn't think it was as terrible as most people thought. And I think if they had spun it as like, this is a temporary thing that people wouldn't have minded it as much, but because everyone like, I, I believe the intention was like, if this is successful, this is the way it's going to stay, but it wasn't, so... Plus the Iago animatronic caught on fire. <laughs> but So they, like, changed it back. But I I guess part of it's also because I thought the, like, featuring of uh, Oa is pretty cool. Just because it's Trader Sam's. But anyway, that's my unpopular <laughs> opinion. I didn't think it was terrible. I mean, it wasn't, but it's one of those things where, like Brian said, you know, it's a classic attraction, and to see it replaced with something that's, for the most part, like, you know, the thing with that is that both of those movies that, you know, Iago and Zazu come from are from our generation. Like, it's more generational than anything. (laughs) Yeah, and it's not canon, so that's kind of 
probably a problem a lot of people had. Eh, I guess so. But, I mean, I guess I am thinking of it more in the sense of how they do Haunted Mansion Holiday and, like, Space Mountain Ghost Galaxy and Disneyland. How people know that, like, this is temporary, this is just going to be this time of year, so they're fine with it. And I know that Disneyland is mostly locals, whereas Disney World is mostly tourists. But I think, like I said, if if Disney were to do changes like that and just be transparent, like this is temporary, it's going to go back, then I think a lot of people would have less problems with changes like yeah, that. That's true. I mean, there's still also some flack, or at least there was a little bit when it, it really first started going off for Haunted Mansion holidays. Like, a lot of people weren't really into that. So, hmm. I don't know. I think that it depends on how long they do it, what they do to it, and, you know, what if it's like a change that is going to affect people that once in a lifetime trip kind of thing you know i think maybe it's just because i'm the kind of person that goes so often that you know I, the best example for me is the jingle cruise you know it's a very subtle addition to the jungle cruise and i don't think anybody goes on that you know during the holidays if they're you know an out-of-town guest that's on vacation that doesn't get to go very often i don't think anyone goes on it and says oh man i wish it was just the jungle cruise you know like, it, I think it can be done very well, and I kind of actually wish that more rides did that. I See, that's the thing. I can agree with something like the Jingle Cruise, where it's very slight, and it's like... The, the thing about that is the Jungle Cruise doesn't really change because it's the Jingle Cruise. Yeah, the jokes do, and there's decorations on the ride, but then you kind of get that like gray area where it's something like haunted mansion holiday where it's entirely different where it's like, you know, that's, that's not the haunted mansion. It's just the story of nightmare before Christmas. And I think that's where a lot of the issue comes from. Mm -hmm. So do we want to talk about this next one that we have on here? I am very unqualified, but I will do my best. I've, so, I've spoken my opinion on this plenty <laughs> of times. Um, we can still kind of talk about it, though, because it's still a somewhat polarizing decision. But the let's just say the overall changes done to Journey into Imagination. Um, I'm not really going to say much about this because... I don't have too much experience with anything besides the last one. Um, and it's one of those things where it's very, very hard to say anything when it's an attraction that you actually kind of don't hate. So spoiler for one of my, my Disney <laughs> guilty pleasures. It's one of the few rides at Disney that just feels cobbled together for me. And that's, so out of place like there's certain things that i don't necessarily you know think are the best it at disney world but this really just feels like they were kind of throwing pieces together as it went along and they didn't really sit down and have like a conscious plan the whole way through what this ride was going to be yeah i like i've probably said before i never experienced the original iteration but i think the general consensus is that it was the best version but i actually i watched uh i can't remember what youtube channel it was it may have been defunct land they had a like section on this whole i guess transformation of this ride and from what i could see the ride was like insanely like detailed and complicated at the very beginning, it had like five different theaters or something. I don't know if this is actually what it like came out to be. Like I said, I never wrote it, but my whole thing about it is that I really like the Figment comics. So the fact that Dreamfinder used to be a thing in the parks is kind of sad to me because I would have really liked to experience the ride as it used to be being a fan of the comics. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, Dreamfinder isn't in the new one at all just seems so weird. He was such a beloved character, and it, they just completely did away with him in the new one. 
Yeah, that is really weird, and I don't understand why they did that. Like, it, not only was he a big part of, or not only was he like you know a big part of the ride, but he was really popular in terms of like characters in Epcot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did they like? Is there ever been? I guess found out like an actual reason for why they decided to make such major changes to a ride that was successful. It's like, I get making changes to a ride that everybody hates, but why would you change a ride that everybody liked? If there was, I've never heard of it. Yeah. It just seems like weird and unnecessary. Like instead of putting that money into something else, they decided, you know, this thing that everybody likes, let's totally (laughs) change it. (laughs) Yeah, I I wish we had an explanation for that. I was just going to say, another thing I think is re- that's really unfortunate about the current iteration of it, from what I saw on that little kind of documentary thing I watched, was how much disarray the, like, I guess, after show part oh, of it man. has become. That's for sure. It's like, it's like embarrassing. It's very like, embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, it's especially compared to what it used to be. It's just not like there's nothing imaginative about it. Like the only thing I could even remember that's in there is like you can make an electronic greeting card to email with Figment on it. I don't know if you guys have more insight into this, but I remember being extremely underwhelmed by it. Yeah, I mean, I haven't even been on Journey to Imagination and probably the past year but i just remember the last time getting off and just thinking man this is this is a sad area like there's like two locations Mm -hmm. on disney property that i get sad at and that's like leaving the gates on like my last day (laughs) of the trip and then like the exit of journey into imagination so as someone that actually kind of mildly enjoys this attraction um the exit area are you talking about like the place that has the interactive like displays and stuff yeah that place Mm -hmm. because there's there are a couple things in there like it's nothing really outstanding but it's like you have a thing where you you move your arms like you're conducting and figment plays instruments like that thing there's the postcard thing like you were talking about like it's it's all stupid things like that and kind of like what you were saying, it sucks because if you look back at, you know, the original exit of this attraction, it was so much more in depth than it is now, and it's just a shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plus, I'm really sad that I never got to go through that rainbow tunnel. Yeah. Same. <laughs> I'm just really hoping that this, along with some of the other pavilions, are you know a part of this big upgrade that's coming to future world in the next couple of years i mean it has to be because like between this like the building is so it cool really is. looking they really like they can't ignore the fact that it's such a cool looking building has such a lame like such lame stuff inside of it i think between this and um interventions they they really got to do some upgrades and give Future World mm-hmm. some love. Interventions is that thing that, like you were saying, Brian, that uh, you get really sad going through this area. Yeah. I get really sad about going through Interventions. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's true, because, I mean, when you see some of the stuff that they used to do in the past, and just the overall like, idea of it is very cool, but they're just not executing anything with it. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying is, like, with Interventions, why did they just take stuff away? Like, it's not like they replaced it with different things or they're doing anything with that space other than, like, some kiosks for the festivals and that new, like, interactive show that they have. But other than that and Colortopia, is there even anything in these buildings? I mean, they took arguably the best attraction out of there, so... Probably not. Yeah. I just, I don't understand changing it for the sake of changing it without 
actually improving anything. So the next one that we have on here is retheming of classic Tomorrowland. I'm not sure who put that in there and what you mean by it. So whoever that was, you're gonna have to take over from here. That was mine. Um, you know the this was the classic like very white, like clean looking Tomorrowland um, that ran from basically the park opening until the mid '90s. And then they basically redid the entire color scheme and design of all the exteriors to kind of what you see today. Um, and this was one of the big things that I know was, you know, pretty universally hated upon by by Disney fans. You know that the the new look just wasn't really fitting with Tomorrowland and and the idea I guess behind it. And I kind of feel like it, it's just carried through today where you see Tomorrowland at and kind of this thrown together mess of attractions that don't really seem to have a lot to do with each other. I kind of feel like the theming also isn't doing a lot to tie the different rides together. Yeah, we I know we've talked about this in several other episodes of how Tomorrowland doesn't really have an identity anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of to bring up a point that I have a little further down on the list I think it's a really a shame that Disney didn't put a whole lot of money into marketing for the movie Tomorrowland because I feel like if they were going to retheme it that some really cool stuff could have come from that movie I don't know if you guys have seen it but it's actually a really good movie in my opinion you know it's like it's got George Clooney and um Hugh Laurie it's like, you know, it's got big name actors in it. And I think the story is pretty cool. And it has a, like Disney references in it, like Small World and stuff and the World's Fair. And I think that they could have taken that and used it to their advantage so much. But I like being a Disney fan. I didn't see any advertising for that. And like I'm actively looking for Disney stuff on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they just really messed up with the marketing on that one, and it it's a shame that they, they could have had something really awesome well, for tomorrow. I, mean, I haven't seen it either, but I mean, just on that point, um, you know, almost every Disney movie that comes out is very, very heavily advertised. It's very strange that this one wasn't. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I just, I don't understand the logic. It's like... You know, Disney's had a, several kind of flops, like especially live action ones in the past five or ten years. But in my opinion, the uh, some of the other flops, like um, whatever, the Lone Ranger and stuff like that, doesn't really have like a cool pull to it. Yeah, but they've advertised so, that. That's the thing. Like, yeah, that's exactly that, what you're saying. Exactly. I don't I don't understand the logic It's like that I've ne I like I didn't care at all about when I heard that movie was coming out I was like okay well I'm probably never gonna watch that because I don't care but then when Tomorrowland the only reason I even really knew about it was because I went to New York Comic Con and they did a panel with the cast of Tomorrowland and the cast of Big Hero 6 and obviously I went to it and I got to see like little clips from Tomorrowland and I was like, wow, this looks really cool. Why haven't I heard about this movie? And I never heard anything else about it again until I watched it. Yeah, and I mean, you would think that if Disney would have put a bunch of money into this in advertising, they would kind of be killing two birds with one stone because they're advertising for this upcoming movie, but kind of to an aside, they're also advertising for their parks. Mm-hmm. Man, I just, you guys should watch it. If I know Brian said that you haven't, but I don't know if you've watched it, Mario. If you haven't, you you really should. It's, I think it's a great movie. I have it. I have the DVD. It came from my um, Disney Movie Club thing, and I just have not gotten around to watching it. It's been sitting on my shelf for the longest time, and I've actually put it in my DVD player to watch a couple times, but I've never seriously sat down to watch it. Oh, man. It's like, I, I I don't like a whole lot of live-action Disney movies, but this is one that I really, really enjoyed. 
And it's like, Damon Lindelof was the director, if I'm not mistaken, and or he may be the screenwriter, but he he's really talented. Like, he's done, I don't know if you guys ever watched The Leftovers on HBO, and he did the Star Trek in the Darkness movie. Like, he's a big name. So it just doesn't make sense why this flopped so hard. Right. I don't know. But. I... That that is a good one though. Like that's a a good thing to think about. I'm just kind of surprised that we haven't heard anything about Tomorrowland's identity. Back to like the point of the retheming. Like we've like you said a couple times, we beat that dead horse of Tomorrowland does not have an identity anymore. We have no idea what it's supposed to be, and now it's becoming more IP central than Epcot is, and no one's really complained about that. <laughs> um, but. I, I would just like for once for them to just come out and say, listen, this is what we're going to do with Tomorrowland. I feel like that's the next land that needs some some love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So we kind of touched on the other one that you had down here, Beth. But do we want to talk about the Song of the South one? I mean, we can. I've never seen song of the south but that just sounded like a you know pr nightmare for disney it it just sounds like it was a really bad decision yeah i don't really know what else we could say about it but i can i i don't know i think it is interesting that they're you know some of the old movies like song of the south and you know, Fantasia has that scene, the pastoral symphony mm-hmm. that they edited the character Sunflower out of because it was so racially insensitive. I just, I think it's so interesting that, that it's such a different time now than it used to be. Like, the fact that someone thought, this is okay, I'm going to put this in this movie. Right, that this wasn't just like one person's slip up. This is the team of people deciding to animate this, it getting approved, and it getting put into a theatrical release of a movie. Mm-hmm. And for those listening, just, I mean, you can, obviously you can Google it. I'm sure you can find Song of the South somewhere. I've never watched it, but for the Fantasia thing, this character, Sunflower, was, um, the whole pastoral symphony is like these centaurs, like half human, half horse women, and there's like, all of them except for one are white and they have like long flowing hair and like makeup on and then you have sunflower who's like this little black girl and the whole time in all the scenes she's like shining their hooves and like carrying their tail for them and stuff and it's it just blows my mind that this it's like yeah this is fine let's keep it in it's just the you know like stereotypical like black face type animation Mm -hmm. that was kind of prevalent back in those days and it's just i don't know you're right just in this day and age it's so strange to think that that could be put into a movie yeah for sure yeah and it's like you said it's one of those things that it's more baffling that it it was okay by a whole team of people rather than like someone just going in and saying yeah maybe that's not right right that like the majority of people didn't speak up and say hey guys this is not gonna look good in like 20 years we should probably (laughs) keep that out yeah so are there any other ones that you guys wanted to talk about anything else you could think of that's like maybe not such a great disney decision Mm. where we want to talk about the things that we can yell at each other for. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like fun. I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's something that we're not thinking of. So if you're listening and you think of one, yeah, shoot us an email. Let us know. We've had uh, quite a few people emailing us. And I apologize because I, I want to get this out now because I, I was reading through our email inbox. And I realized there were some people I didn't really respond to right away. And it took me like maybe a month to respond to some of those early emails so i apologize for that first and foremost and i've been trying to keep up with reading them on the show like 
highlighting them or marking them or something so that we know to read them. But if we didn't read an email from, from you guys, I apologize. Let us know and we'll, we'll be sure to bring it up. Um, but yes, please send us your things that you thought of that Disney didn't do so hot with. So for our Disney confessions, um, we should just take a moment to express the time or the things that, you know, maybe we love that are not so widely received or things that, you know, we hate that are probably very popular. Um, is there anyone that wants to go first or are we all too afraid? <laughs> uh, I'm not afraid. I, I don't know if I should start with my like least shocking or most just shocking. rush right out of the gate with it. <laughs> all right well if you've listened to past episodes you've probably heard this but i feel like this is like the bottom like the two percent of the disney fan population that i'm in is that i am not a fan of space mountain just in general and the reason why in case you haven't heard me talk about it previously is that i think that it's First of all, it's kind of become dated, in my opinion, and I don't think that the effects are as cool as they could be, but I would say that 90% of the reason that I am not a fan of it is because I f- always feel like my head's going to get chopped off. <laughs> I always feel like that too, but I don't hate Space Mountain. For some reason, I find myself riding that every trip, even though I'm like, ah, I'm going to lose my head. <laughs> I know, that's what makes it exciting. And I think also part of the reason I don't like it is because there isn't as much, and this is like a, such an old person thing to say, but there's not as much like support on like your back and neck as the other roller coasters. So I always feel like I like hurt when I get off of it. And maybe it's just because I'm getting on up there <laughs> at 27 years old, but... <laughs> You know, the one thing I will say, though, that I dislike about Space Mountain, and I keep hoping that this is going to come in a refurbishment sometime, but that they'll actually add side-by-side seating like they have in Disneyland. Yeah, that would be cool. And I think, I think also, like, it's just so jaggy. Like, if you're on the back car, it's, like, significantly rougher, Mm -hmm. which I think is another thing that they can improve. I feel like if they were to expand it to make it two tracks, that would take, like, a full closure refurbishment and, like, retracking. Oh, yeah, it probably would. But the thing that I hate is that this and, like, Test Track, the rides are divided up into, like, sections of three. Like, every time I have a picture getting off a Space Mountain, I'm usually either in, like, it's me and my wife or we're in a group with, like, you know other couples so it's you know we're either by ourselves with some random person thrown in the picture or (laughs) somebody got cut out of our group in the picture so it's always been really annoying to me my favorite is when you get those pictures and like either the ride vehicle wasn't moving as fast as it should have been or something happened and your face (laughs) is like in the corner under the space mountain (laughs) logo those are my favorite or and I've noticed this on one too. I think it's kind of depending on how the person's leaning at the time, but like the flash won't really catch like the <laughs> yes. front person, and they're like completely in the dark, and then the two people in the back are very well lit. <laughs> I've seen that too. <laughs> uh, so I'll throw mine out there. My my not so shocking one. Um, I think I'm one of the few people that doesn't actually find the figment from this iteration of journey into imagination as annoying as most people. And a lot of that stems from some sentimental value, um, and memories from previous trips where we would ride that one ride specifically because my aunt used to like the older versions, but I'm one of those people that's not totally afraid to admit that they still kind of care about figment after that. Well, I definitely still care about Figment. Like, I have way more Figment merchandise than I probably should. But, again, going back to what I was saying earlier is because of the comics. I, like, 
I don't know. I I definitely find the figment in the ride to be pretty annoying. And I don't know how he was in previous iterations, but I just feel like that's not that's not the figment that I buy merchandise for. I buy figment for the comic book. Well, and it's kind of like they took the kooky sidekick and made him the main character in the attraction, which I think is the biggest issue with it. You know, he's fine is is kind of like the laugh on the side, but I don't think he should be front and center in the attraction like he is. Yeah. And also, from what I've heard, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, because you rode the original, right? I haven't ridden it. I've watched plenty of ride-through videos and, you know, done a lot of digging into the history of it, but I, I don't ever remember riding the original one. Okay, well, you're definitely going to be more knowledgeable anyway, so correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've heard in the previous iterations, Figment was like, he kind of had like this childlike sense of mm-hmm. wonder, and... And they kind of turned him into this, like, prankster who sprays skunk farts on you. pretty much. Yeah. Which I think is unfortunate. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the thing that stinks, like, in comparison to what he used to be. Yeah, that's, that's really sad. But from the point of sentimental value, I still... I'll, I'll still ride it. So, Brian, what's your... Uh, confession all right well i think i went into this a little bit wrong um about the overall ideas but because i have some like i thought this was going to be like stuff that we've done while in the park that we are like kind of embarrassed about but oh no i definitely want to hear that too okay but i guess (laughs) to start off on on this kind of one i've talked at length about you know liking country bear jamboree as much as i do and i think there's at least a decent amount of people that like Country Bear Jamboree, but one that I almost always hear people hating on that I really love is uh, Swiss Family Treehouse. I really love these type of walkthrough attractions. It's kind of like a mini Tom Sawyer Island, in my opinion, and I, I actually wish that Disney did more stuff like this. I like Swiss Family Treehouse, too. My issue with it and I don't know how this could possibly be resolved but I would like it significantly more if I didn't feel rushed every time I do it that's true I always feel like people are like walking up behind me and I can't take take the time that I want to but I I totally agree with you I like the walkthrough type of attractions and wish they would do more I know I've said this before I want them to update Swiss Family Treehouse specifically because I feel like it has no value for like kids today as old as that makes me sound um i mean i don't think it really has value for our generation either. it doesn't but that's the thing is like it if it had some kind of like attraction or not even attraction but like ip value for any more recent generation i think it would be more appreciated than it is now i think a lot of the problem is is like who really knows and cares about the the swiss family robinson so what you're mm-hmm. saying is Disney needs to remake Swiss Family Robinson. I mean, that's an answer <laughs> to that, too. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I don't know how well that'd be received, but, I mean, I it's an option. I very well, but regardless, <laughs> I like the attraction. I See, and that's the thing. I like it, too. I think that it's it's a good attraction, and we need more stuff like that where it's it's just kind of a walkthrough interactive thing. My favorite thing that I've ever heard coming out of that, though, is I heard someone go, that's it, after leaving Swiss Family Treehouse. So <laughs> I feel like people get in line for it, expecting that to be the cue for something, and then leaving and <laughs> like being totally disappointed. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're going to just go in a circle? Is that how you want to do Sure, it? we can just go in a circle. I only have a couple, so we can go until we run right. out and then just tap out. Well... Here's another one that I've talked about before, but for those who have not heard every episode, here's my unpopular opinion, is that Mickey pretzels suck. (laughs) Blasphemy. They are bland. They are chewy. They're dry. 
I don't like anything about them except for the fact that they're Mickey shaped. And I know on a previous episode, Brian made the point that it tastes better because it's Mickey shaped versus if it was exactly the same recipe, not Mickey shaped. And I will agree with that. But other than that, literally being Mickey shaped, I don't think there's any redeeming quality about these pretzels. And it blows my mind that so many people talk about Mickey pretzels and have t-shirts and hats. And that's like their, that's their Dole Whip. Like Dole Whip for me, like somebody's Dole Whip is a Mickey pretzel. (laughs) I don't get it. Yeah, I don't, I don't get that either. Um, I think it's the whole everything's better Mickey shaped thing. Yeah, but there are so many things that are Mickey shaped that are delicious, like Mickey bars and ice cream sandwiches and whatever. Yeah, and they're usually sold at the same carts the churros are at. And like, how are you gonna get a pretzel over the churros? Right. Yeah, I don't know. So, I guess mine, and I've talked about this a little bit. I'll bring up the one that I brought up before, but I don't really hate Stitch's Great Escape as much as everyone (laughs) does, which is weird to say because I don't think it's a good attraction by any means, but I also don't think that it's as horrible as everyone says. If they got rid of the chili dog smell, I'd be totally cool with it. Yeah. I don't... I don't know. I don't like it at all, but I don't, like, have a burning hate for it either. I think that's where, like, I'm kind of at, because, not, like, where I'm at, because on one hand, I really love Stitch, so I think maybe that has something to do with it, but it's one of those things where everyone just, like, rags on it, everyone hates it in the Disney community, but I'm just here, like, it's not as awful as it could be, it could be way worse. Yeah. Like, I think it's a bad attraction, but I also think that most of the hate it gets is kind of just, like, people jumping on the bandwagon and it kind of being an in-joke in the Disney community. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. But at the same time, like, is there an attraction that you guys would consider worse than Stitch's Great Escape? Yeah, Journey to Imagination. Okay, other than that. (laughs) And and I've said that I don't hate either of them. Wow. Um, See, that's the thing, is, like, I... Maybe it's just me being, like, super biased, but I don't think Disney has done an awful attraction to the point that I'm, like, super against it. Like, I'm not one of those people that's like, shut down Stitch's Great Escape right away, even though, you know, it is shut down. Um, But, (laughs) I like, I don't know. I didn't have any feelings about it leaving, and I also wouldn't have had feelings if they had just kept it there. Yeah, I mean, I definitely... I'm excited at the prospect of it becoming something else, but I don't like it doesn't keep me up at night. So back to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. I I still have not seen Happily Ever After, which on its own is pretty bad, but I've also been to Magic Kingdom like no less than 10 times since the show switched over and I still (laughs) haven't seen it um yeah I still feel bad about it I feel like I I need to do it especially you know since I'm doing this podcast I feel like it's kind of like basic Disney stuff that I should have experienced before but I still haven't to my defense I'm hardly ever there at night the last two times that I can remember being there at night was for the Halloween party and for the Christmas party, which, of course, they weren't doing happily ever after then, so I guess that helps me sleep better at night if I think about it that way. But <laughs> See, don't feel bad because there's plenty of things that I haven't done. I mean, obviously, I haven't gone as much as you, but still. That's what like, I'm saying. <laughs> I feel like most other people, like any other big Disney fan that goes as often as I do has done a lot of the things that I haven't. I mean, this is one of the few things I can really think of, but still, it's like, it, it's a pretty major one. And I don't know. I'm just hardly there at night. So, I do really want to see it. Yeah. It's like, it's not for not wanting to see it. It's just like, when I go, I'm thinking like, man, you know, I always have an extra, 
you know, probably two hours by the time I leave Magic Kingdom till I'll actually get home, by the time I get back to my car and drive. So to stay that late is usually a hard sell. And I think a lot of that has to do with you being local. Yeah. Like, if you were there on, a, like, a, a stay-in trip at, at one of the resorts, I think you'd probably have that time to go through and do, you know, what you want to do. Oh, absolutely. And the last two times that I stayed uh, were for the Halloween and Christmas party. So. So let's do one more, and then we'll we'll tie that up. Right. Yeah. All right, so I feel like I'm not going to be alone in this, like, between the three of us, but I, this is something that I see or have seen a lot of people hate, but I liked the Sorcerer Mickey hat at Hollywood Studios. I agree. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I was like, I'm probably in good company with this, but, yeah, I see so much hate like well more so when it was there now that and rather than now that it's gone but i just never really understood why everyone hated it so much i think it gave hollywood studios an icon that it never really had like mm -hmm, people can argue the earful tower but i don't think it was like iconic enough to really be considered the park icon you know the great movie ride I mean, wasn't you had to tall enough really in my opinion to, you know it physically wasn't big enough to be a park icon i think the sorcerer's hat was that for hollywood studios i mean that's what they kind of used for the the icon when they would do like the four park icons on merchandise it was usually the sorcerer hat so right and like you said the great movie ride wasn't big enough to be an icon the earful towers like off to the side like you pretty much don't even notice like you wouldn't have even noticed it if you weren't paying attention and then a lot of people would argue that tower of terror could be considered the park icon i guess especially now that there's not really one but that's also kind of off to the side whereas if you think of the other three parks the icon is like when you walk in this big extravagant thing and that's what the sorcerer yeah. hat was and they i I wonder what they're going to do in the future. Like, I guess, are they using Tower of Terror currently as the icon? It's probably going to be the Chinese theater. Because I, mean, I, Again, I feel yeah. like to our generation of Disney Park, I was like the people that started going when we were younger and stuff like that. The Sorcerer's Hat was your icon. Like, it was right there. It was in the center of the park. It was right up front. And, you know, a lot of people argued for the Chinese theater to be the icon because of that reason unfortunately you know the the hat blocked it i didn't mind the hat i didn't think that it was a bad addition and i honestly think that like brian said it gave hollywood studios a more clear park icon i just feel like it's time yeah. probably came and not that they can really tie anything to be the icon for this park now but it definitely wasn't that well it hurt my soul to watch it come down in pieces yeah and that was a slow process <laughs> so slow <laughs> oh r.i.p hat so my next confession and i feel like this is kind of a dumb one but i honestly do not think that seven dwarves mine train is worth any type of weight that it gets i don't think that it's mm -hmm. worth anything above even 20 minutes and that may be a little harsh but I feel like the ride itself lacks so much. It's so short, and it even the things like the the rocking train cars that they advertised. I don't think I've ever felt that once. Mm -hmm. So to mm -hmm. me, it just I feel like that's an attraction that falls flat on a lot of the promises that they put out there, and I also feel like it gets a lot more of a wait time than it really deserves. Yeah, it always has a Absolutely. huge wait time. I would never ride it without a yeah. fast pass. I mean. The dark ride elements of it, I think, are cool, but the actual ride system, it, it's not worth the wait. Well, here's the thing, and you guys know this about me. that like I've said it on the show a thousand times. I hate projection faced animatronics, so that doesn't help because the whole dark ride portion of it is all those projection faced animatronics outside of that one section at the end. But like, 
even that, it lasts about five seconds. Mm -hmm. And the other Mm -hmm. thing that really gets me, and I don't know if this was just bad advertising on Disney's part. I don't know if it was, like, me expecting more. But I remember when that ride first opened, and we were coming in, we were on the, the Magical Express to go there, and they played a video of the dark ride portion of Seven Doors Mine Train. And I honestly feel like I could have just watched that, and that was all I needed from that ride. <laughs> like, all it was was the, the dopey projection face, and it was, um, it was just, I don't know. It's very underwhelming. I totally agree. Yeah. And I think that's the thing is, like, you build it up in your head because, you know, I remember when this ride came out, I was so excited for it, I, you know, all that other stuff. And then it's that short. It's not really that exciting. And then even the wait time, you know, you're standing in line for 45 minutes, you're like, okay, there's got to be something good going on here. And then you get off after seven seconds of ride time, and you're like, that wasn't worth it. Yeah. The only ride that I think I've intentionally gone in knowing I'm going to be here for more than 45 minutes was Flight of Passage on my last trip and it was 100% worth it every time. But that's the thing though. I think like a a ride like Flight of Passage deserves that kind of weight. Like if it's it's something innovative and you know uh, exciting by all means and honestly Seven Doors Mine Train is probably exciting to someone but it's just not me. It's like I could see it as like my first roller coaster. Yeah. You know? But aside from that, I I could take it or leave it. So Brian, what's your your final Disney confession? Okay, so like I said earlier, I guess I sort of misunderstood what this was supposed to be because <laughs> when I heard personal Disney shames, I thought this was supposed to be like things we had done in the park that we were shameful of. Oh no, I'm excited for this one. Okay, now. But I'll, yeah, me I'll too. I'll tell this story anyways because I always, I always thought it was somewhat funny. Um, and I'll preface this by saying I, I, I'm definitely not recommending you do this because there's a reason that there's height limits on oh, rides no. and stuff. <laughs> but when I was a kid, um, we went one time, and I don't know how old I was. I must have been six or so, and I was a like fairly short kid I guess when I was that age anyways I remember we went one year and I was I I always loved like roller coasters and stuff and I wanted to go on some of the bigger ones like roller coaster and stuff they were there at the time and I was like an inch under the minimum height to be on these and I remember like we went I couldn't get on it and I was getting frustrated and upset throughout the day because I wasn't able to get on any of these things so (laughs) <laughs> me and my parents went out later that night um and we went to like walmart or somewhere and this is it's gonna sound so stupid but we bought a pair of like the women's like wedge flip-flops <laughs> and we cut the like strap part out of them and glued them onto the bottom of my shoes and went back to the parks the next day and i'm telling you it worked I got on all the rides. I was close before, but it just gave me that little bit more that I needed. And I'll always remember that because, like, I was so excited that it worked, that nobody figured it out, that we had done that. I guess they don't really look at your shoes <laughs> while they're doing it, but, again, that is hilarious. I don't recommend that, you know, it's a safety thing, but... That's... Wow. <laughs> if I had to go back, I'm sure I would do it again, so... Oh my god, that's so funny. I I literally feel like that's something that you would see in a movie. <laughs> so is there any last minute ones you guys want to throw out there? Or should I read these emails? I think I'm yeah. good. Okay. So we had a couple things come in these last two weeks. Um, we just never actually really had the chance to record last week, so I apologize that there was no episode up. Um, but we had an email come in from our friend April. Um, she mentioned that she loved the resort episode, which a lot of people were, were giving us pretty positive feedback on that. I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, but she said that she's staying at Riverside for a couple nights at the end of the month. And it's the first time that she's going to be staying there. She's hopping to Polly for breakfast and Trader Sam's is another one of her first that she's going to be doing that trip. Um, but she wanted to know 
if there is any snacks that she should really be looking out for. I would assume anywhere in the park is free game, um, but she's looking at some snack credits, and she wants to cover those those snacks, and she wants our help. Um, so any mm. anything you guys want to throw out there for April? Dole Whips, yeah. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> well, number one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely that. Um, I guess slightly off of her actual question, I know she said that she's hopping over to the Poly for breakfast. I'm assuming she's going to Kona Cafe, and I'm going to say you have to get the Tonga Toast. That is on my list to try. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about Tonga Toast. While she's there, can't she get a uh, Dole Whip at the Poly? So she could probably she do can. a lot of her yeah. stuff at the Poly. Mm-hmm. Um, there you go. I mean, I'm partial to to school bread as another snack. That's a good one. Um, I don't know. Snack credits are always... Well, don't get the Mickey pretzel. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> but snack credits are always a hard thing for me. Like, I, I know I do dining plan, and I know I... Like, you know, out of all of us, I think I'm the one that does it the most, if at all. But whenever we do it, we always use ours. Like, this is my big tip. Use it for, like, pastries or something for breakfast just to kind of, like, buy your time. And then use your regular dining credits for, like, your quick service, counter service would be your lunch, and then your sit down for dinner. And we used to do that a lot where we would go to, like, the bakery in France early in the morning. Like, that would be where we would go as soon as world showcase opens we'd grab like you know a pastry or something and that would count as a snack credit for us so that's my big thing with snack credits i don't know if anybody else has any tips about it but that's what i like to do with them well i've never done the dining plan before and it's a good thing that april brought this question up because one thing that i see a lot and i don't know if you've dealt with this before mario but i see a lot of people complaining that at the end of their trips they have a lot of leftover snack credits, so they just end up going and blowing on like snacks to take home and stuff. Do you generally have a lot left over, or do you use yours pretty well throughout your trip? It depends. If you're smart about it, like I said, you know, doing things like that where you, like, even if you eat a Rice Krispie treat or something for breakfast, just something to, to kind of fill that slot where you're not going to have your, your sit down and your table service. You can be smart about it and manage your your snack credits well enough that you can you know use them all one per day but generally yeah i have seen that happen i've had it happen to me a couple times where at the end of my trip i'm trying to like round up my credits and figure out what i can do with them to make the most out of the dining plan and i think that's where it gets a lot of flack is like not only with those credits but like people feel like you have to eat a lot in order to make it worth it and for me the dining plan's worth is more in knowing that i don't have to bring money into the parks that it's all mostly covered except for tips. Mm. I just want to say, uh, you said Rice Krispie Treat for breakfast, and I like your stuff. <laughs> it was just the first <laughs> thing that popped into my head. Like, even if you take my advice and go to, like, the France bakery and, you know, grab a croissant or something and eat that for breakfast or, you know, anywhere that you can find that breakfast snack credit, that would be my best advice for tracking them um but you could certainly use them for things like the cinnamon roll in gaston's tavern or um you know a dole whip or stuff like that and i think it's all in how you want to use it as the best use of your snack credit so um i can't remember if she said what time of year she's oh going. she's going this month <laughs> okay, so Flower and Garden. Oh, yeah. The kiosks, you could use snack credits at. So definitely, like, check them out, and all the menus are online if you want to look in advance and pick out a few. But I hear that those are generally pretty good value, and most of the stuff at the festivals, I think, is pretty tasty. I haven't had anything that I really hated, for sure, but most of the stuff, I think, is pretty good. And it's, like kind of cool and unique like stuff that you can only get this time of year yeah and plus i think it's a lot of fun you know you don't have to go and like commit to one type of food you can go around and try different stuff as you walk around world showcase Mm -hmm. another fun snack credit that's kind of off topic from that that i i went to go look something else up and this popped up um zebra domes if you don't have a reservation at any place that serves them you can get them 
at most places in Animal Kingdom Lodge, I think. And you can pick up, like, a, a $4 pack of them, but I, I'm pretty sure they count as, like, a snack credit as well. Hmm. Didn't and know that. The thing that I was going to look up that I know is part of this now because I, I wanted to double check my information, LeFou's Brew is also a snack credit. Oh, man. So and LeFou's that's Brew is nice. excellent. That is a very mm-hmm. good use of a snack credit. For sure. I want to throw out one that I feel like doesn't get as much love as it should, and I don't know for sure if this is a snack credit or not, but... Any of the like cinnamon glazed roasted nuts, like pecans and almonds and stuff, I think those are amazing. Yeah, definitely. That that to me is like my phantasmic snack because they're like the kiosk is always right outside. <laughs> That's another good thing. Like, grab yourself like some popcorn or like roasted nuts when you're watching Phantasmic or Happily Ever After. I know that you know sometimes you can get wrapped up in the show, but having that snack is sometimes nice too. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, a lot of our correspondence this week was a lot of stuff about the resorts. Um, I have to say coming out of that episode and hearing all of these positive things and lots of experiences from people that have stayed at these resorts, I think that was, that was really good. I really appreciate the time that people took to tell us about their trips. Um, I know we had, uh, one of our listeners, Maria, telling us about the beach club. I don't know if you checked that comment out, Brian. But she talked about the pool, and I was very jealous. <laughs> um, we had a lot of people <laughs> saying things about, you know, we helped them a little bit with talking about the resorts that they're staying at in the future. So that was really cool. Um, we really want to reiterate that we definitely appreciate you guys taking the time to tell us what, you know, what you like about our show and what we can do better. So if there's ever anything you want to hear us talk about, as always, let us know. Um, did you want to read that one? I'm going to cut this part. But did you guys want to read that one from Juan from a while back <laughs> that he responded to? Oh, um, yeah, I think that would be good. Um, let me pull it up. What are we talking about? So to, I'll sum it up for you. So essentially we got an email a little while ago from one of our listeners who is going on a trip. Um, they're doing three days in the parks. They wanted to know if they can do two parks in one day and what our advice would be for that. Um, I know Brian had answered this, but we kind of wanted to touch on this and, you know, maybe if anybody else was thinking about it, kind of reiterate some information that we might have to, to give some tips to anyone that's thinking they might want to do two parks in one day. So do you want to give them what your response was first, Brian? Or... Yeah, but so, so we, you know, I, I hear this a lot, um, people asking how best to split days at parks, at parks and which parks you really need to devote um, an entire day to. And in my opinion, with the state things are in right now at Disney World and with the construction stuff going on at the different parks, I would suggest devoting an entire day at Magic Kingdom and an entire day at Animal Kingdom and then splitting a day between Epcot and Hollywood Studios if you only have three days to go. Um, I know plenty of people will probably disagree with me on this, and it really is hard for me to say to split Epcot and not spend a full day at it because it, it is very, very possible to spend multiple days at Epcot without running out of things to do. So it, it is hard for me to say that you should split it between Epcot in Hollywood Studios right now, but I think Magic Kingdoms is going to be the obvious for almost everyone to say that you need to spend a full day at at Magic Kingdom. I mean, it has the most attractions, and you're going to have to spend a lot of time, even, you know, even if you're you're, you're going fast, you're going to end up needing to spend at least a day there to get a lot of the stuff knocked out. And I think Animal Kingdom right now, with Pandora... Um, if you really want to do everything in Pandora, you're going to need to spend a whole day there. And I also think it's just a good park to spend a whole day in because you can go and, you know, if you want to hit the Pandora stuff early, the rest of the time at Animal Kingdom can be a really nice, like, relaxing kind of, you know, not necessarily laid back because there is a lot of exciting stuff to do at Animal Kingdom, but it's not as 
is hustle and bustle as being at Magic Kingdom and, you know, waiting in a lot of queues and stuff. So I would definitely think that you would want to spend a day at Animal Kingdom and really take it in and enjoy it. Um, Hollywood Studios is, I, I mean, that's the obvious one to, to say that you can just spend a half day in there because even when it's running at full capacity, just with the amount of rides, I don't think there's much more than a half day's worth of stuff to do there. Um, and, you know, it, that's, it kind of just leaves Epcot to throw in there then on your other half day, I think. But, again, that's just my personal opinion. I'm sure a lot of people would, would not want to throw Epcot in on the other half day. I think it all depends on what your group consists of. Um, I mean, for this instance, we'll say that there were two children in this this party um so to brian's point you know epcot may not actually be the park that would be good for that kind of touring party um if your group you know consists of some small kids and two adults you're going to want to do all the attractions that are themed to the you know the kids needs um specifically in that instance epcot would definitely be the park that you would want to size down maybe do a half day of that do the attractions in you know future world and then maybe hop to hollywood studios or vice versa um now if you're a party of people our age or adults you could spend a full day in epcot and honestly you might even be able to spend a half day in animal kingdom knock out the pandora rides maybe do expedition everest hop over to hollywood studios do tower of terror and test track it all really depends on what your party consists of and how intense you want to tour the parks. Um, you know, we've said that a couple times. You can tour the parks any way that you want to. Any make of group can really do whatever they want with them. But to look at the park from that perspective, if you've got kids, maybe downsize Epcot. If you don't, if you're a party of adults, you can probably shrink Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom. I think if I had to pick, I would also go with what brian said but that's probably based on bias yeah and I, I that's the thing like you know if you want to do world showcase you're gonna have to spend time there because it opens a little later and we've said i've said it before personally epcot is a park that you can really do whatever you want with it it's what you make it so <laughs> i don't know if you want to spend mm -hmm. a whole day you can if not don't i know that's not really helpful but that's the way that I look at it. <laughs> but so, but I think we can all agree Magic Kingdom needs its own full day and the Hollywood Studios mm -hmm. can be done in a half a day. Oh, hands down. So right. the real question, you know, like Mario was saying, is, is look at your group and really decide if Epcot or Animal Kingdom wants to be the other one that you devote a full day to. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that um oh sorry to reroute back to another email if we're done with that one are we done with yeah that i one? think so okay um april had a couple other questions that i just realized um she wants to know fitting a ferry ride to disney springs um what's the best time to do it and how long does it take and anything at polly and riverside that she should check out pin trading secrets entertainment etc um really wanted to reroute to that because entertainment if you're at riverside and you haven't checked out yee <laughs> bob you're missing out yep so you're doing something wrong there <laughs> um but yee bob for the people that don't know it's a fun entertaining piano show that happens in the lobby of port orleans riverside um it's usually typically later at night um very very fun show very interactive it's one of those hidden gems that Riverside has that really makes it more of a deluxe value resort for the moderate price. Mm -hmm. uh, and ferry ride, that shouldn't typically take too long. I want to say it's maybe about a 20 minute, half hour ride at most. Oh, I, mean, I was going to say shorter than that. I thought it yeah, might Yeah, probably about 15. 20 minutes max, if that. Yeah. Um, I, they usually run like all day. If you're planning a Disney Springs day at all, just take the ferry. I do think that they, there's definitely a schedule for it. I don't know exactly what it is off the top of my head, but um, worst case scenario, you can always 
take the boat there and then take a bus mm-hmm. back. Though I would suggest if you are just able to do the ferry at any time, I think it's especially cool to do at night, which I also think is the best time to do Disney Springs just because of how cool the lights are and stuff there at night. So that's what I would suggest. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Anytime that you get to do anything at Disney at night, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to say that's it. Like I said, everything else was just people talking about resort stays. Um, real quick, I do want to ask a question to a listener. If they are listening, I'm going to respond to your email, but I really this, this really intrigued me. One of our listeners, Vanessa, had shot us an email about some deluxe resorts that she had stayed at. Um, probably because Brian and I had such very little experience <laughs> when we were talking about that. But... One of her comments was, last summer I stayed at Beach Club, club level, free upgrade. I would like to know how you did that. (laughs) So please send me an email response because I would really, I'm I'm intrigued. So that's that's my my emails for this week that I wanted to go over. Also, if you ever need like a buddy on one of these trips where you stay at Deluxe, I know a guy, (laughs) a girl rather. (laughs) I, I know about four people that would like to stay with you if you couldn't feasibly right. say that. Yeah, if anybody is interested in sponsoring a, a DVC membership or anyone on the podcast, just we'll, uh, we'll let you know the address you can just mail an envelope full of cash to. So. <laughs> oh, on a similar note, when uh, Club 33 opens, <laughs> any, anybody out there listening that has the connect... I know some people who would gladly join But seriously, gosh. though, like, anybody that is going to have a Club 33 membership, because I can almost guarantee none of us will, um, I think that would be something we'd like to have someone come on the show and talk about. Because yeah. that is yeah, definitely sure. a unique experience. Seriously, if you're thinking about getting one, if you have one, after you go, shoot us an email. We'll get you on the show. I will, I will purposely make it happen just so you can talk about it. Tell us if you think it's worth it. Tell us, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, and, you know, we've had a couple people reach out to us and ask about, like, you know, maybe coming on the show and talking about some things. If you've ever done anything, like, super interesting at Disney or you have anything to bring to the table, let us know. We'll see what we can do about maybe getting you on just to kind of chat about it. Um, but, obviously, in that instance, I do have to say we can't bring everyone on as much as we would love to. So, it's got to be something that we either have no experience with or we will never have any experience with um just to kind of put that barrier up there but feel free to send us yes we'll we'll definitely do that please send us emails tell us how they are (laughs) i honestly one of my favorite things to do has been respond to everyone that's sent us stuff it's so much fun getting to talk to people and connect with people um all over about disney that's one of the, the best things about doing this podcast yeah. So, is there anything you guys want to talk about before we wrap this week up? I think yeah. I'm good. Then that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for joining us again on another episode of the Station 71 podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts at. And leave us a review as well. We'll be happy to discuss your questions, comments, concerns on the next episode. If you want to get in touch with us and talk a little bit about Disney, you can find us on Facebook.com backslash Station 71 pod. We're on Twitter at Station 71 pod, Instagram at Station 71 podcast, and you can send us your emails to Station 71 podcast at gmail.com. We hope you enjoyed your ride and we'll see you real soon. Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas.